something about hearing somebody you know can cook saying breakfast <laughs> or if you know they can cook and they say dinner before you even got into the table and picked up your fork to taste it you are filled with expectation and excitement you ready because the meal has been prepared and you know it's going to be good and do you good this morning, I'm not hollering out breakfast, I'm not hollering out dinner, I'm hollering out communion. <laughs> and knowing that the wafer and the juice have been prepared to make you excited before you even partake of what you would find in a natural meal. I'm not asking you for a verbal answer, but I'm asking you to personally reflect this morning. I feel led to spend the next few weeks dealing with the foundational sacraments like communion and baptism and feet washing because do I have any Bible study people in the house? Because we're talking about the foundations. We're talking about the fundamentals. So we might as well talk about it on Sunday as well. Can my Bible study people say, that's all right, Pastor? I am afraid that many things 
things like communion have become less valued or understood, that they become more of a tradition or a custom and less of an opportunity for us to reflect or to celebrate Jesus or even to proclaim his sacrificial death to a dying world. And he told us to do this in remembrance of him. If the church, I mean us, the sons and daughters of God, the believers, if we stop celebrating it, if we stop revering it, if we stop teaching it, if we stop doing it, what is going to happen in the world and in the church? If we don't appreciate it, how can we expect people outside of here to value God's meal? If I can appreciate my mama's food and it was good. If I can appreciate my daddy's food and it was good. If I can appreciate American food, Italian food, Mexican food. I'm sorry, honey. My wife's food. She's standing there. She's like, what about my food? Yes, your food too, honey. Surely I can appreciate the meal that Christ has prepared for me and for you. And he told us to eat and to drink. I hate to admit it or to think about it, but it's possible for communion to lose its importance if we let it lose its importance. If we treat it like this is the ritual, this is what we do on Sunday morning, this is what we do on first Sunday, this is when the uh, mothers dress in white, when the deacons dress in black and white, when the uh, clergy have on their clergy attire, and it becomes more like a fashion show than a reverence for what we're about to do because of what he did. Mm. It could become real common if the church lets it. It could become a real tradition if we let it. It can become less than what Christ intended it to be if we let it. But we're not going to let it because we realize it's a privilege to have communion. Apostle Paul is writing here to the church because they are starting to misuse and abuse communion from the intent of Christ. He's reminding them what Jesus said. And if that doesn't at least quicken you, if you hear what Jesus said, and that does not make you think about something, make you reflect about something, make you change something, make you listen differently, then I need to check your heart. Because it does matter what I say, but it matters what Jesus said. And in the verse, Paul says this, for I received from the Lord. What I'm telling you, I received from the Lord, and that's what I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So we see that Jesus did this for us. His broken body was and is for us. I can't just say was for us. It is for us because it's alive. It's still working. It's still doing great things in the lives of people. So as I would begin to unpack this this morning, I would tell you communion helps us see all that God has done is powerful. Somebody yell out for me. It's powerful. And in order to see the fullness of what Christ has done for us, we have to see what Christ was up against. And it's this three-letter word called sin. Let me tell you about sin. Sin will have you bound. Sin will have you self-serving. Sin will have you self-satisfied. Sin will have you comfortable in something you're supposed to be uncomfortable with. Sin likes to attack you on multiple levels, you, on word, thoughts, and deed. He likes to attack your dreams. He likes to exploit your past. This is sin that I'm talking about. Sin likes trying to depress you in your present and make you die before your future. This is sin. This is what sin does. Sin will have you stuck living beneath your privilege. Sin will have you trying to cover up what God wants to change. That's what sin does. Sin is like a virus. It will spread like a wildfire. Sin is, will make promises that it never keeps. Sin will tell you that something looks good and feels good, so it is good, but it's a lie anyway. Sin will have you think that you're in control when you realize you never were in the first place. Sin is one who has a takeover spirit. If you invite him in to one thing, he'll take over the whole place. And when I say that, I mean you. He'll have you doing stuff. You're like, how did I do that? Because you let sin in, and a little bit will go a long way. Somebody say, that's what sin does. Sin, 
plan. It's something that it will tell you. You know, you were in control and you could do this, but it will set a trap for you. And that trap is meant to be forever. That's what sin will do. It will exploit every trauma you've ever had. It will exploit every uh, impulse you've ever had. It will exploit any insecurity you've ever had. It will exploit any unresolved need you ever had. It will tell you you're attracted to something you never were. It will have you convinced that you are lusting after something that you should have. It will have you ambitious beyond what God said. That's sin. Somebody holler sin. Sin has been around since the beginning. But all it does is changes its accessories and its fruit to have you doubt God. All it did was change its clothes and tell you, did God really say? Instead of wearing a fig leaf or wearing nothing, now it just has on some bell bottoms or some tight jeans and some high heels. And it's still trying to tell you. Change its clothes, but same talk. Did God really say? Sin will have you collecting stuff in your cart of life, pushing that cart to the register, and then it'll hide the price tag for everything till you get to the checkout, and then so you won't know how much it costs, then you'll realize you're stuck with a whole bunch of stuff you collected, and you don't got nothing to pay for it. That's what sin does. It'll say, put that in the cart. You want that? Put that in the cart. You want that? Put that in the cart. It'll have you have a whole shopping cart full of stuff you can't pay for. Just so it can set you up so it can embarrass you and shame you because you don't got nothing to pay for all that you collected. And it has you sitting there in a bunch of shame so you'll be isolated and ashamed and embarrassed and say, look at all that you collected. When sin was the one who tempted you, sin was the one who talked to you, and sin was the one who set you up. That's what we were against. Sin wants to embarrass you, shame you, when you have nothing to pay your debt with. But that's what we were against. But Jesus comes into the store. You at the checkout, and you don't got nothing to pay with. And what he's saying is, I'm going to pay for that, but you're not taking that with you. He paid for what I collected, but he said, I got something better for you. You don't want that. That ain't healthy. That ain't good for you. That ain't right. I know you collected it, thought you needed it. Sin made you think you needed it. It was good for you and all that deceptive stuff. But I'm going to pay for it, and it ain't mine, but I'm going to give you something better. That's what he did. Sin was a giant, but I thank God that Jesus was a David. talking junk about everybody. And Jesus said, oh, I got something for you. Somebody say, all you need is the right one. I remember a story when I first started teaching. There was just a, this young man who would just act up every day in school. And this was back during the time, 30-something years ago, when you could actually call parents and they would answer. And then if they answered on the phone, they would come to the school because they would tell you, don't make me leave my job. So they came to, and then that would strike fear into the lives of the children everywhere. If they knew that their mama or daddy were going to leave their job because they knew they were in for something. And then when this mother got to the job, she said, I just need to talk to him for a minute. And once she talked to him for a minute, I saw her 30 years later. And she said, I'm going to just call him Tommy after. I'm, I'm sorry about that. After, I'm going to just call him uh, Thomas. And then after Thomas, she said, 30 years later, she said, I didn't never have to go back to that school. And, and I said, well, why do you think that was, mother? And she said, because he had the right one. Jesus didn't never have to deal with the devil because he had the right one. See, they can talk all that junk, all that stuff that they need, but all you need, say holla, all you need is the right one. If you get the right one, he will settle it once and for all. And all that stuff, he will shut it down. He will turn it out. He will turn the lights off. He will turn the key. He will lock it up. It ain't going to happen no more because you get the right one. Jesus said, oh, sin, you got the right one. 
You've been celebrating because we've been killing all these goats and all these sheep and things like that. But I got another sheep that was slain before the foundation of the world. That sheep, you got the right one. That's one whose blood keeps on giving. I don't have to, I don't need another one. I don't have to get another one next week. I don't have to get another one next five minutes because his blood continues to work. Somebody hollered, sin got the right one with Jesus. He shut it down all the way down. One time, all the way, never to be dealt with again. Jesus is the one who did it once for all time. First Peter 3 and 18 says, this is a good scripture, so everybody's taking notes, write it down. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us, I love that, that he might bring us to God, putting to death the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. How many times did he do it? Oh, I need to see your fingers for this. How many times did he do it? One time. He brought me close to God with one move. It was heavy. It was unbearable. So I don't want you to think it was easy. We got to think about the price of it. It wasn't his, but imagine going to the grocery store, like I said, and you forgot your wallet and you had $1,000 worth of groceries. You're there embarrassed, and then the man behind you says, I'm going to pay for your groceries. Imagine how thankful you would be. And he gave you something that won't perish. He put something in your cart that won't fade away. How happy we should be. He paid for something that wasn't his, and the price tag was heavy. Imagine having the weight of the whole entire world, even those who were not born and those who died, who having all that weight on your shoulder. And with you having all that weight on your shoulder and still saying, you know how much you carry. Just your own issues. Just your own problems. And you're like, Lord, I can't take it no more. Jesus, I can't make it. Imagine having yours and his and hers and those unborn and those who died. All of those people on yourself. We know it was hard because Jesus was in the garden and he said, if it be your will. Let this cup pass from me. He had an inkling of how heavy that was. Everybody's. Not just the ones you talk about. Not just the ones people know about. The ones you don't want nobody to know about. Those two. The ones that will make you run out of this church. Those. The ones that would humble you real quick. Those. The ones you said, Lord, I will never do that again. Those. That's how heavy it was. It was the price and the penalty. If you go to the grocery store and you, they ring up all that stuff and you try to take it with you, there's a penalty because there's a price associated with the goods. There was a price associated with the sin. And a price that we could not pay. He paid the price and he took the penalty. How do I know? Because it says in the word of God that he went to hell to get the keys back of the grave, death, and hell. It was so bad. Hell means separation from God. When he was on the cross, he said, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? So there was a penalty that God turned to his back. I want no parts of sin. Because I'm holy. I'm righteous. I'm just. I can't be with sin. There has to be a payment for it. So Jesus had to bear the price and the penalty. So when I come to this table. 
I have an appreciation for the power of Jesus. Because there was a price for sin. This won't no easy, cheap thing that he did. Once now, forever. I know it's easy to be like, oh, he forgave me my sins yesterday. But his death didn't have an expiration date. It was past, present, and future sins. There was a penalty. There was a price for what he did for me. He paid for what he didn't collect. He paid for what he didn't put in the basket. He paid for what he didn't want you doing. He paid for what he told you not to do. He paid for what grieved him. He paid for what broke his heart. He suffered for something he didn't do. He was ridiculed and mocked and stripped and pierced. For people that accused him of doing what you did. And you really did do it. But he didn't do it. And he did it for me. He did it for you. Somebody put your hand on yourself and say, he did it for me. Sin is a bad joke. But Jesus is better. I'm trying to paint the picture for you about how sin does. Because sometimes we use that word and we don't even think about the gravity of what would happen if he didn't handle sin. We become so arrogant and we become so comfortable because we didn't have to pay for it. We just think that it was an easy thing. There was nothing easy about it. But he made a choice. Pay for what he didn't incur. Pay for what he didn't endorse. Pay for what he didn't approve of. For me. Somebody holler, for me. Through communion. We also see that what we receive is personal. It's not just powerful, it's personal. All through this text, we see personal pronouns. My blood, my body, for you. We see all those things, which means it's personal. Those are called personal pronouns. So this exchange at the communion table is personal for both Jesus and for me. It was always personal for him. So it's supposed to be personal for me. It's personal because of its availability. He changed times and accessibilities. This thing before Jesus died on the cross was only supposed to be for Jews. It commemorates the Passover. It was only supposed to be for his chosen people. And it was only supposed to be in that period that they lived in. But when Jesus came, he changed the calendar. He changed the membership requirements. He said, this is available for whosoever wants it. Jew, Greek, black, white. So that's why we can't be so mad at the uh, Caucasian people because they tried to stop it. But Jesus said, it's available. It's available. He changed the calendar. He said, this thing is not going to have an expiration date until I come back. So that's why I'm glad. So it was good for my grandmama, but I'm glad that it didn't stop with my grandmama. I'm glad it's good for me, but I'm glad it don't stop with me. He's a legacy God. He changed the accessibility, the availability. He changed the time. He said, if you want it, you can have it. They were trying to keep us out. But Galatians says, we have received the spirit of adoption. And the adopted child gets the same rights as the natural born child in the eyes of God. He said, we call him Abba. That's not even formal. That's daddy. And he said, as often as you do it. 
That means they can't even stop you if you wanted to do it eight times a day. As often as you want to do it. It's available to you. It has the same power the seventh time as it did the first time. It doesn't lose its power. You can have it all day, every day. That's something about this meal. It won't cause you indigestion. In fact, it'll probably clear some stuff up if you have it enough. All it's done, when he says as often as you do it, it's governed by your willingness and your desire. Taking this cup and this wafer reminds you of what? has been made available to you, and it reminds you of your identity. We often say that Southern food reminds us of our identity. It reminds us that we're black folk. And that, that does have a tradition that's tied back to the South, back to the times when we could have limited stuff and we knew how to make a little bit out of nothing. But that's not the only identity that I need unveiled when I'm having a meal. And if you are only characterizing yourself as a sinner who is saved by grace, you're missing the whole idea of communion. If that's, that's how you always define yourself, well, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Save that for the Williams brothers. That's a part of my testimony. But that's not all my testimony. You're missing what communion did for you. Communion reminds you of the whole picture. I'm not just a sinner saved by grace. He said, I'm a conqueror, and I'm more than a conqueror. Somebody got to read the whole Bible so that you'll understand that I am more than just a sinner saved by grace. And communion lets me know I am a conqueror and more than a conqueror according to Romans 8 and 37. I'm not just a sinner saved by grace. I'm more than a conqueror, but I'm also redeemed. The Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. I was in his hand, but he snatched me out. But the difference is, can't nobody snatch me out of his hand. He was able to snatch me out of the devil's hand, but can't nobody snatch me out of his hand. I hear Psalm 103 Verses 1 through 4 says, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all my iniquities, who heals all of my diseases. Wait for it. Who redeems my life. My life. You need to get that. Your whole life. From destruction is that who redeems your life from the pit. My whole life was in the pit. It might have looked good. I might have smelled good. I might have thought I was doing good. But without him, it was headed for the pit. When nothing else could help. My God from Zion. Love picked me up from the pit. Planted my feet on solid rock, changed my name, told me, you don't belong in the pit. Wake up and get up. Redeem my life from destruction. And what redemption means is it puts value back on something that was worthless. Don't call me worthless. I've been redeemed. Don't call me nothing. I've been redeemed. I'm worth something. I'm going to teach you a five cent word, too. More than a conqueror, redeemed, but he also became my propitiation. That's my five cent seminary word. Then I'm going to tell you what that means. It means he took my place to satisfy the wrath of God. Because you need to know God was mad. And I know you may say, ain't nobody mad like my daddy, but I want to say there is somebody who has more fury than your daddy, your heavenly father. And he says, somebody's going to have to pay for all this stuff that stinks in my nostrils. He says, somebody has to satisfy this wrath. We 
We take it for granted because we're able to come and go as we please. We don't drop dead in the presence of the Lord. We are able to do as we please. So we think we got it going on. We feel like we've arrived. Somebody paid for that. The fact that I get to come in church and I don't drop dead because of my sin. Somebody paid for that. That they didn't tie a bell to my leg saying he ain't coming out. And if, he, if we don't hear that bell, that they got to drag me out. Aren't you glad that you got to come in and walk out? Not just that you enter with thanksgiving. You ought to leave with some thanksgiving. That this won't my last time. They used to sing, I'm so glad this ain't my last time. I came in church. I love church because of the mercy of God. But that happened because somebody prayed for it. Somebody holler. Somebody had to pay. And his name is Jesus Christ. God was mad. And guess who he was mad at? Us. You may want to take a scapegoat and say, like Adam, it, it's her fault. Because you, you know that's what we do. Whenever trouble starts sniffing around, you know it was her. And sometimes we'd be real slick and we'd be like, we don't say nothing, but we start pointing our fingers. We start using body language. We don't say. We, we start trying to tell on them on the slide. I ain't say nothing. <laughs> but we wind up shifting the blame because we can't handle or we don't want to handle the consequences. God was mad at us. Somebody had to pay. Jesus did. So now I can confess I'm not just a sinner saved by grace. I'm more than a conqueror. I'm redeemed. He has been my propitiation. But I am accepted and beloved. That means I can come into his presence. And he's like, there go my son. In whom I'm proud. There go my accepted. He's there with his arms wide open because somebody paid. It wasn't free admittance. Not in the beginning, it was free afterwards. It's like the kids coming into Chuck E. Cheese when I had one of my kids' parties, and it was about 15 of them. They were coming in, and they were like, oh, it's free. I'm like, no, it wasn't. The guy up front paid. Oh, my God. The guy up front paid. I entered in, but somebody paid. I came through the door, but somebody paid. You, you, you. They ain't just that good hearted. Somebody paid for what I enjoy. Somebody paid for the life I live. Somebody paid that I might come boldly to the throne of grace and pray and have an audience with God. Somebody prayed. Somebody paid so I could pray to God and he would hear me. Somebody paid so I could come to this table. It's a free meal for me because he paid. I can come to the table as much as I need to, as much as I want to, because he paid. I can worship the son because he paid. I can pray to the king because he paid. I can study the word of God because he paid. I can grow in Christ because he paid. So I'm charging the church instead of this new wave coming out where it's always talking about, oh, I got to get my blessing. Name it and claim it. Blab it and grab it. Turn around three times. Getting you all worked up because the organ is playing. 
modulating three times in a hoop. And I'm not against black preaching. What I'm trying to say is, if you want to excite me, tell me somebody paid. Tell me that I went from enemy to embraced by God. You want to excite me? Tell me I've been changed because he paid the price. Tell me I've gone from shame to saved. Tell me I've gone from canceled to continue. Tell me I've gone from condemned to conqueror. Tell me some good news. Let that spin around three times and do this because I'm waiting for God to do stuff. He already did stuff. Don't be so messed up waiting for God. Say, I'm looking for God to do this. Yes, he does do things, in the, but how about what he already did? That changed my eternity. I went from deceived to delivered. I bought a bill of goods that would have sent me straight to hell. But I was so glad my eyes of understanding were open. I saw I needed God. In him, I know I have eternal life. I went from left out to lifted up. I was left out of the Holy Ghost Survive Party when all the saints get together. I was left out, but he lifted me up. I went from failure to freedom. Because he who the son. How did he set me free? Because he paid. Though we put... Jesus on a necklace on the cross. We have all these great pictures. That's a nice artistic thing. But he paid for that. Somebody holler, it's personal. So when I come to this table, it's personal. I remember how powerful he was over sin. I remember how he changed my position with him. From enemy, he didn't want to see me coming to him saying, come on, son, let's walk together. Did you ever think about that? He wasn't even studying you because you reminded him of disobedience. But one Savior could die and change the whole dynamic. What was ugly became acceptable. What was unwanted became desired. He said, to them that even believe on his name, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God. Let me give you one more. Communion helps us to see what's asked of us is proper. I said powerful, personal, profitable. I want when you come to this table today that you have a different outlook and talk about the privilege of doing it. Verse 27 says, whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. So let a man examine himself, then and so eat the bread and drink the cup. So what he's asking us to do is not to treat this table worse than you treat your table. Because what I didn't say when somebody hollers, sinner, <laughs> you ain't going to sit at the table of any clean person because they're going to say, did you wash your hands? <laughs> you ain't going to just come in from outside, smelling like outside, looking like outside, and just going to sit down and pick up your fork. They're going to say, did you wash your? Yeah. So there's an expectation 
that there is a pause for cleanliness before coming to the table. Now, if you do that for your table, how much more before we come to his table? He says, let a man examine himself. He didn't say you were supposed to be the detective. He didn't say you were supposed to spot it out and say they don't have no business taking no communion. He said, let a man or one man examine himself. He said, you can't treat my table more common than you treat yours. After all Jesus did and is doing for us, he asked that we would examine ourselves, but listen to what he did say. He said, examine yourself, but listen, he didn't say condemn yourself. So see, there's a distinction there. So examination is for the purpose of making sure that you are stepping to God's table with the right attitude, with the right outlook, understanding what he's done, and that you have a heart that is willing to content, repent, and not just the generic, oh, Lord, forgive me, because we've been taught to say that in tradition. Lord, forgive me. I got a couple more that I, I, I told you that I'm, I added to mine. So it's not just, Lord, forgive me. Here's what I say. You can have it if you want. I don't just ask him for forgiveness. I say, Lord, I need you to help me die to myself. Because the table points out to me what death can do. Because Jesus died, it opened the door for life. Lord, help me die to myself. Help me die to myself. Not just, Lord, forgive me. I need you to help me die to myself. Because this thing right here, sometimes it get unruly. Sometimes it get crazy. Sometimes, sometimes this thing right here and flesh, they, they be just like this. They be besties. <laughs> they, they be besties. They be all tied up, tangled up, talking to one another. Say, let's do this. It'd be cool if you did this. Lord, help me to die to myself. Lord, help me yield to you. Lord, help me submit to you. Lord, help me follow you. Then I added one and I said, Lord, help me reflect you. I need to look like you. Have my attitude and my actions reflect you? And listen to the part I said, for real. Not just from 10 to 12.30 on Sunday. Lord, let it reflect you for real. Not just during church time, during church service, when it's real good for me to look holy and look like a Christian. Let, let, let me look like you on Monday morning when they try on my nerves. Let, let me look like you on Tuesday when I had enough and I wanted to. Let me look like you on Wednesday when it's enough out of the week and my patience are gone on Thursday. Let me look like you when I'm supposed to wait on the Lord and be of good courage on Friday. Let me think, not think about it as payday. Let me think about it as a day that I can reflect God. Help me look like you for real. And in order for me to look like him for real, something's got to die. He is not interested in cohabitation in you. And they are the one calling the shots. So what that means is this. He's just like, so one has to die. And I already did. So that flesh has to die. That means that you make the choice as you learn about God's way that you decide to choose God's way over your way. Because nine times out of ten, your way 
<laughs> well, they, they say that a broke clock is right twice a day. <laughs> so maybe, maybe, I'm going to give you once a day. Maybe. <laughs> but you are choosing his way over your way. And most of the time, it don't feel good. Most of the time, it's not desirable. Most of the time, you feel like a punk. Most of the time, you feel like they're getting over on you. Most of the time, you feel like you lost. And in the world setting, you did. But who are you trying to please? Do you want a temporary victory or eternal victory? That's, that's all I got. That's all I got. Do you want temporary or do you want eternal? But choosing opens the door for you to have eternal victory. In Paul's day, there was elitism. People were just feeling like they were better and treating the people who were poor worse. And that's what Paul was talking about in this text. When he ended up saying in the verses before, he's like, what are you doing? Going there, ah, treating this like this is one of your sweet parties. Where you're drinking, doing all sorts of crazy stuff at my table. Eating all the stuff so that the poorer Christians don't have nothing when they come. Just being all elite. And Jesus was not like that. We may not be having parties around this table, but there's still elitism that needs to die within the body of Christ. Where our attitude towards his table is not what he wants. Mm. Communion, let me help somebody too. Even with all that I said, and I got one more thing and I'm going to be done. The communion table is not the time to focus more on what you have done than what Jesus has done. So I'm, I'm not trying to bind you up and have you. I'm having you examine yourself and to pray to yourself and say, Lord, I don't just want you to forgive me. I need to die to some things to make us reflective so we're not just coming treating this like a tradition that we do on first Sunday where everybody gets dressed up and everything is cute. Everybody, we do this together and we read our prayer, but we're not applying it to ourselves. The key is application. But it is not for us to focus more about what we've done than what he's done. I come here because of what he has done. He said, do this in remembrance of me. He didn't say, do this in remembrance of me. He said, do this in remembrance of me. Examine means to yield, examine to surrender, examine to reflect, examine to die to yourself. And some areas of my life will only be changed if I'm willing to die to myself. You're like, Lord, do it. He's like, I'm trying. I need you to die to yourself. We in agreement. I'm trying to do it. You asked me to do it. I'm trying to do it. So he says, examine yourself. And the other thing that is profitable here is in verse 33. It says, when you come together, and I never thought this before, to eat, he said, wait for each other. So our charge that's profitable is that we would examine ourselves. And then even though this is a personal thing that we're taking, he designed for us to do it in community. So he said, wait for each other. This is personal in many respects, for he gave communion to the body of Christ. So we, we can't be trying to leave out each other, race past each other. So I said, this was my prayer. Don't, Lord, don't let my anxiousness or my attitude make me miss what I'm supposed to see in my brother or sister. What I'm supposed to do for my brother, because I'm anxious. Because I'm so self-serving. I'm like, I wish they'd hurry up. Deacon's trying to serve everybody. It's almost 12 o'clock. They should have hurried up. I'm sending you 
to 1 Corinthians 11 and 33. It says, wait for them. And I'm like, Paul, I have delivered unto you what was said to me through the word of God. So if you're mad with somebody, get mad at the word of God. Wait for each other. Because I'm not supposed to see waiting for them as a waste of my time. God, help me. You may not want to admit it, but there are times that we get impatient with one another. And we feel like waiting for them is a waste of our time. It's an imposition. We don't feel like doing it. We're tired of it. They don't deserve it. And he said, wait for each other. Lord, forgive me when I come to this table that I'm only thinking about me and not thinking about the corporate. When you gave this gift to the body of Christ. So that I will not see my brother and my sister as a waste of my time. Communion is a gift to the body. It is a meal that heals. But I want to give you one more. He told me that this is family dinner. There was a tradition in the African American family. It was called Sunday dinner. And I know a lot of families have left it. A lot of families don't do it anymore. But he said, this is family dinner. You know why you have to wait for each other? Because it's family dinner. It's not just a meal that heals. It's not just a victory meal. It is family dinner that he has prepared for us. Yes, he prepared it for me, but he prepared it for us. So when I come to this table and I want to be in a big rush, take it Monday by yourself. Take it Tuesday by yourself. Take it Wednesday by yourself. Take it Thursday by yourself. Take it Friday by yourself. Take it Saturday by yourself. But on Sunday, It's family dinner. The whole purpose is that we as the body get to do it together. When I come to this and they pass this plate and then the deacons are leading and they say, take, eat ye all of it, you're having family dinner. He says, drink of this cup, drink ye all of it, we're having family dinner. I need you to see this differently when we go to this table. And to think about it differently because that's where it will benefit you. If this only stays as a ritual, something that I enjoy doing on every first Sunday because my mama brought me to church and that's what we did and that's how we did it and it was nice and everybody was all dressed up and everybody was smiling and the deacons read this and the mothers stood here and the we belittle because we become so focused when it's a ritual we become so focused on what we're doing that we forget about what he did Never shall forget what he did. Because I knew that the cost, the price, the penalty, the power of what he did. And so caught up in the church experience that we neglect the power of the sacrament. I love the church experience. I love the black church experience. However, I refuse to not have us be taught about the things that we are doing because you will be misled and it gives the time for sin to continue. If, it, if you're only concerned about the song you're singing during communion and you're not listening to the rest of the stuff that goes on, you're belittling communion. I'm talking now but there is going to come a day where Jesus is coming back. And 
when he comes back, we're going to be able to commune with him in another place. So if you don't like family dinner now, I feel bad for you because he ain't stopping it because you don't like it. What's done now is just a picture of what will be done in heaven. So I encourage you not just to try to like your brother or your sister, try to love them. Because love is the gateway. Family dinner. Everybody stand.
this table, this family dinner that's set before us it's because of all that he's done from the cross to the grave from the grave to the sky I lift your name on high
I do. Yes, I do.